story of how God was seeking a bride for his son. Each book is different from every other book. I'm trying to give you the keys for you to unlock it for yourself. Now, we're still reading Leviticus as if we were Jewish. So, uh, let's continue saying a few things about the whole law of Moses. It's called the law. It's not called the laws. It's called the law because it all hangs together. Holiness means wholeness. And all these rules and regulations fit together and form one whole. Therefore, if you break any of them, you've broken the lot. It's a bit like a lady's necklace. If it breaks at any point, the beads scatter. You have broken the necklace and it all goes to pieces. That's a very important point. It's not just trying to keep so many. I used to have fun with boys in the RAF. They always thought that a Christian was someone who keeps the Ten Commandments. And when I asked them, okay, how many of you keep the Ten Commandments? Nobody did. And then they would say, oh, well, you can't keep them all. And I said, well, how many do you have to keep to be a Christian? They always said six out of ten. <laughs> Very interesting. That's what most people think, you know. Do as many as you can. Students need only attempt six out of ten. But it's all of a piece and if you break it at any point, you've broken the whole thing. You've broken the wholeness or the holiness of the whole way of living. That's the first thing I want to say. Now I want to say two more things about Leviticus. Number one, God didn't give reasons for all his rules, for not wearing mixed clothing, for not breeding cross-breeding animals, for not sowing mixed seed. God is a God of purity. He doesn't like mixed material for clothes or mixed seed or mixed breeding. He doesn't like that. He's holy. He's pure. But he doesn't always give reasons. And our Western minds, our modern minds, want reasons for everything. Why did he not let them do this? Now, sometimes the reason is obvious. It may be simple hygiene. Some of the regulations about your toilet are obvious. They are hygienic reasons behind what God told them to do. And it may be that some of the forbidden unclean food was because pig's flesh was peculiarly liable to disease in that climate, in that area. We like to have reasons for everything, but I want to underline that God didn't give them reasons. He didn't say, this is why I'm telling you not to do this. And that's very, very important because if you want to know why a regulation is given you, then you are not willing to let somebody else be the judge. You are making your own reason the judge. And there are times when my wife and I had to say to our children, because daddy says so. See? And the important thing is, if you will only obey a commandment when you see the sense of it, you are not an obedient child. And you do not trust the one who gave you the command. Do you get that? It's a very important point. Most of the laws in the law of Moses, there is no reason given why they had to do this or not to do it. God is saying, do you trust me? Do you believe that if I tell you not to do something, I have a very good reason for that? Do you have to know the reason before you will do it? Or do you trust me enough to obey me, believing that I know best? Do you see the issue? And I'm afraid modern man wants to know what is the point of chastity? What's the point of this? What's the point of that? If you can convince me it is for my good, I will observe it. You see, that's man wanting to be God. And it's as old as Adam and Eve taking the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We want to decide. We want to experience. We want to settle it for ourselves. And if you want to know the reason behind every command God gives you, you are not trusting him and you are not an obedient child. It's almost as if the whole Bible says to us, because daddy says so. Now, how much do you trust your daddy? It's because your father in heaven says so. So that's a very important point. He wants obedient children, trusting children, not those who say, well, I can see the point of it now, so I'll do it. But those who are willing to say, well, God, if you say so, that's good enough for me. You must have your reasons. There are many things God doesn't show us. He's got no obligation to explain himself to us. 
things will happen to you and your family which you will not understand. The important thing is, do you trust him then? To believe he's got a very good reason for allowing that to happen? Or do you say, no, I want to know why? Why? That's the first thing then about God's law. He doesn't give reasons, but he does give sanctions. He does give sanctions, and we mean by that, frankly, punishment. There is a call for obedience, there is also the cost of disobedience spelled out. So while he didn't give reasons for his commandments, he did give punishments. And these are pretty severe. Or to put it another way, in chapter 26 of Leviticus, you've got a whole lot of positive reasons for being obedient. There are rewards for obedience. There is blessing for those who trust and obey. But by the same token, there is a curse on those who disobey. Now let's assume that I'm Jewish and I'm reading the book of Leviticus. What could happen to me if I disobeyed it? Well, there are three things that could happen. First, I could lose my home. I could lose my home, my house. Secondly, I could lose my citizenship, my passport. Thirdly, I could lose my life. And there are 15 sins in the book of Leviticus for which capital punishment is the consequence. Now, frankly, if you knew that reading and obeying the book of Leviticus or disobeying it could cost you your home and your passport and even your life, would you be studying it a bit more <coughs> deeply than you have done? I think you would. I want you to read it, you see, as a Jew and realise that your home and your passport and your life itself depends on you living this way, that you could lose all three. It's as serious as that. Furthermore, the book of Leviticus makes clear that the whole nation, if the whole nation does this, they can lose things. And two things in particular. First, they could lose their freedom by being invaded by enemies from outside. And when we come to study the book of Judges, we'll see that happening. That is the first punishment if the whole nation ignores the book of Leviticus. The second punishment would be that they would lose their land and be driven out of it. Number one, to be occupied in the land by another power and therefore lose their freedom. Number two, be taken away into slavery right outside their land and lose it altogether. And both of those things happened to the nation of Israel. See, you don't play games with God. He says, there are rewards for trusting and obeying me but there are punishments for those who distrust and therefore disobey me. So if you were Jewish, you would read this book very, very carefully. What God is actually saying is really that the only way to be really happy is to be really holy. That holiness and happiness belong together and that the lack of holiness brings unhappiness. Now, most people get it wrong, you know, God's will for you and me is that we be holy in this world and happy in the next. I find most people want it the other way on. They want to be happy here and holy later. See? Which is understandable, that's the fleshly desire in us. But God's will for you is that you be holy here and happy later. You can choose which way around you want it. To be holy here can be painful. God is willing to let things happen to you and to your family that may be painful, but you'll be more holy as the result of them. Because actually, when is it you get most holiness? When you're comfortable and happy and everything's going fine? Or when things are going badly and you find your own weakness and you find your own need? You throw yourself on God again. When does your character make most progress? When everything's fine or when it's not? Well, there's a note in Leviticus that God chastises those he loves in this world. He punishes those who don't respond in the next. So, holiness here, happiness hereafter. Well, we've finished reading the book of Leviticus as Jews. Let's read it as Christians now. 
what has all this got to say to us? Do I have to take off all my Marks and Spencer's clothes? <laughs> if I get dry rot in the house, do I have to burn the house down? What, how do we respond to all this? Well now, let's start with something Paul said to Timothy. Let me read it. He said, Timothy, from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now simplifying that, remember that he's talking to Timothy about the Old Testament. New Testament didn't exist when he wrote this. And the Scriptures in the New Testament are the Old Testament. And when Jesus said, search the Scriptures for they bear witness of me, he meant the Old Testament. And he's saying you can learn about two things in the Old Testament, about salvation and righteousness. And we can learn about both from the book of Leviticus. These are the two reasons for reading the Old Testament. It will open your eyes about salvation, make you wise unto salvation, you'll understand how to be saved, and it will open your eyes to righteousness or right living or good living. Now those two purposes just shine out. I remember years ago a vicar said to me, David, would you take my Lent series, uh, the midweek Lent meetings, five of them, leading up to Easter? I said, gladly. What do you want me to speak about? He said, I'd like you to speak about the cross. He said, leading up to Easter, we want to understand the cross better, so would you please uh, speak about the cross five evenings? I said, right. And he said, give me five titles, please. So I said, here they are, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. No, he said, I want you to talk about the cross. See, I said, I'm going to. I said, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you see. Now, what did I speak about? Genesis, I spoke about a man who had a son in his early thirties. The man was Abraham, the son was Isaac, and he was in his early thirties. And Abraham took Isaac to Mount Maria, which was later called Golgotha or Calvary, and he offered up his son. God stopped him at the last minute and God provided a ram with its head surrounded by thorns in the same place. And Abraham called the place Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. I said, if ever there was the cross, because Isaac was old enough to overcome his old father, but he submitted. Exodus, I talked about the Passover lamb, killed at three o'clock in the afternoon so the angel of death would pass over those who were under its blood. Leviticus, I'll come back to that in a moment. <laughs> numbers, numbers, well once when the children of Israel in the wilderness sinned, God sent snakes among them and, and they were dying from these poisonous snakes and, and they cried out to God and God said to Moses, lift up a brass serpent on a pole, put it up on a hill and when anybody's bitten by a snake and they look at that pole, they'll be healed. You know John 3.16, don't you? Do you know John 3.15? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so will the Son of Man be lifted up. And of course in Deuteronomy, what did I talk about there? Silence. <laughs> Cursed be everyone who hangs on a tree. And that curse is picked up in Galatians 3. Well now, what did I talk about in Leviticus? The scapegoat. One of my favourite pictures is by a painter called Holman Hunt. There's the picture. I think that's his best picture of Jesus. I don't like the other one. I'm sure you've seen the picture of the light of the world with Jesus knocking. Oh. <laughs> Three girls were used for that, one for the figure, one for the face and one for the hair, dressed up in bishop's robes and she's outside a barn door. That has nothing to do with the verse in Revelation 3.20 which is a church door that Jesus is knocking at. But this is my favourite Holman Hunt. He spent 18 months by the shores of the Dead Sea risking his life in bandit infested territory to paint the picture. There are the hills of Moab and they do turn that colour in the sunset. 
and that's Nebo where Moses died. And here's the scapegoat with all the sins of Israel on it, dying. There's the skeleton of last year's. Look at the eyes. Something about that picture. If you go to Port Sunlight in the Wirral, in the art gallery there, you'll see the original. Very moving picture. Jesus the scapegoat. Do you know there is a Jewish tradition, a Jewish tradition, that in the year that Jesus died, the scapegoat came back into the city and brought all the sins back. You don't get rid of them that way, says God. Not now. There's a new way and a new scapegoat who suffers outside the camp. Well, from Leviticus we learn some very wonderful things, but let's look for a moment at the New Testament use of Leviticus. That's always very illuminating to see what the New Testament does with an Old Testament book. Somebody says, the old is in the new revealed, the new is in the old concealed. Well, they belong to each other and each testament outlines the other. There are a number of direct quotations from Leviticus in the New Testament, but two in particular come very frequently. One is, be holy for I am holy, and the other, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Those two keep coming up in the New Testament and therefore are the most important things for the Christian to read in Leviticus. But there are many other passages where it is clearly in mind. And in particular, the letter to the Hebrews cannot be understood unless you read Leviticus first. Don't try and read the Bible straight through. The books are not in chronological order. Whoever put them together seemed to work on the principle of putting the biggest first and the littlest last. So among the prophets you've got three big ones and then twelve little ones. Uh, in the letters of Paul you've got Romans first and Philemon last on the same principle. So we've got it all out of order, so don't just read the Bible straight through, you won't make sense. I suggest you read a book of the New Testament, a book of the Old alternately. And if you do, read Leviticus and Hebrews together. They absolutely belong to each other. Hebrews could not have been written unless Leviticus had been written first. I have reckoned there are 90, over 90 references to Leviticus in the New Testament. Over 90. So it's a very important book for Christians to get into. So what do we make of the law of Moses? That's the big question. See, there are 613 laws, not just 10. The 10 usually get stuck up on the church wall, but 613. Instinctively we know that we're not tied to them all, but how many are we tied to? Well, there's a bunch of people coming to share the premises soon, Seventh-day Adventists. They believe we are tied to the Fourth Commandment and they will begin their day of worship at 6 p.m. tonight and finish 6 p.m. tomorrow night. And they are born-again Christians who believe in Jesus, but they believe we're under that law. Then there are many fellowships, I find, teach tithing. I can't find that in the New Testament, but it's amazing how many churches teach their members to tithe. And what about the Sabbath? There's a whole discussion at the moment about Sunday trading, but what a mixture of motives I find among Christians from humanitarian motives, which are good, wanting people to have a break, to Sabbatarian motives which belong to the law of Moses. What are we going to do with all these laws of Moses? Every Christian has to come to terms with this and it's complicated by the fact that Jesus said, I have not come to destroy the law but to fulfil it and not one jot or tittle that the tiniest letters of the law will be abolished till all is fulfilled. So what do we make of all this? We have to ask how each law is fulfilled. And it's obvious that some are fulfilled in Christ and finished with. That's why you don't have to take a pigeon or a lamb when you go to worship next Sunday. It's been fulfilled. Every law will be fulfilled. I believe the Sabbath law is fulfilled for us every day of the week when we cease to do our own works and do His and enter into the rest that remains for the people of God. You are still free to keep one day special if you wish, but you are also free to regard every day as the Lord's Day. can't even impose Sunday on other believers 
never mind unbelievers. We're free in Christ. Very important to realize what is the fulfillment of each law. Of the Ten Commandments, nine are fulfilled in the New Testament in exactly the same way. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery are fulfilled. The Sabbath law is not. And there are many other laws of Moses that are fulfilled in different ways. One law said, for example, that when you're using an ox to thresh the corn, walking round and round, its hooves breaking the wheat from the chaff, you mustn't put a muzzle on it because it has every right to eat what it's preparing for others. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he's treading out the corn. Do you know the fulfilment of that in the New Covenant? You pay your pastor a proper wage. That's what it says, 1 Corinthians 9, and Paul quotes that law and gives it a completely different fulfilment. So you've really got to take it little by little and see how it is fulfilled, filled full in the New Testament, given a deeper meaning. But there are four things that I learn from the book of Leviticus which are unchanged. And these four things are crucial to the New Testament as well as the Old. And uh, the book of Leviticus underlines them more than any other book. Number one, the holiness of God. There is no book in the Bible stronger on the holiness of God than this book. And it's a thing that we forget at our peril. I wrote a book called The Road to Hell, as you know, and suddenly the number of local radios that wanted interviews and they all asked the, the very same question and the question was, how can a God of love send anyone to hell? It became boring after a bit, but I used to answer the question by asking one. That was a technique I learned from Jesus. It lobs the ball back into the other court. And I said, how do you know that God is a God of love? They were really shaken by that. You know. I said, how do you know God is a God of love? And they always said, well, didn't Jesus tell us that? And I said, yes, and didn't Jesus tell us about hell? So there's something, there's something, you know, you can't pick and choose. Either Jesus spoke the truth and said God is love, and you accept that, and he spoke the truth that there was a hell. You can't pick and choose and say Jesus was a liar once and on one occasion and speaking the truth in the other. That's to make ourselves the judge again. But I said, actually, his understanding of love was a little different from ours. Ours is sentimental love. His is holy love. And his love is so great that he hates evil. Very few of us love enough to hate evil. And you learn about the holiness of God from the book of Leviticus. Therefore you learn to worship God with reverence, with a holy fear. If there's one thing missing from a lot of worship today, it's the fear of God. A lot of familiarity with God, but very little fear of God. I was in Sicily last year and I wanted to climb Mount Etna. Uh, it's the largest live volcano in Europe and it's spewing lava down over the villages even now but the snow was too thick to get up. But as we took off from Catania Airport, the British Airways plane, the pilot tipped it on its side when we got right on top of Mount Etna and we looked right down into the crater. And that's what we saw. And we looked down into this crater and the plane was just up on one side like this and I was, looking, I was in the window seat looking straight into this cauldron and I thought, well, that's very interesting, but I hope he'll soon uh, <laughs> level up and get us to London. I thought, if that blows at this moment, we've had it. There was a kind of funny feeling in the pit of my stomach, looking right down into that. I was on the last plane out of the Philippines before the big one blew there, and after that no more planes could take off because of the dust. And you, there's, a, there's a, a power, a force just below our feet that when you see it released, it does something to you. Listen to Hebrews. Hebrews says, let us worship God with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. He got that straight out of Leviticus. And it's very important to read Leviticus to keep this sense of God's holiness. Not just that God is good, 
The world says that. Good God, they say. They're right. But Christians know God is more than good. He's holy. That somehow makes things a bit different. And we know that nothing unclean must come within his presence. Because holiness and unclean things must never come into contact. Holiness and clean things can come into contact, but not unclean. This is the sense of God's holiness that comes through and Leviticus tells us. Secondly, Leviticus really underlines the sinfulness of man as well as the holiness of God. It's so realistic, it's so down to earth. God is under no illusions. The Bible is very much an adult book, you know, nobody teaches Leviticus in Sunday school. Here is human nature capable of bestiality, incest, superstitions, all sorts of horrible things which are an abomination to God. That word, we haven't a strong enough English word to match the Hebrew, it means something that makes you want to spew, something that makes you so disgusted that you just feel sick. Abomination. The Bible's about God's emotions. I tried to get a word that would match loathsome, repulsive, abhorrent, couldn't find a bad enough word. Hebrew word is a very, very strong word, something that just makes God feel Ugh. That's because he's holy. The sinfulness of man. And the sinfulness of man is not just in polluting clean things, but in profaning holy things. And of course that's what commoner garden swearing is. It's profaning holy words all the time. Because there are only two sacred relationships in our lives, that between man and God and that between man and woman. And 90% of swear words come from one or other of those two relationships and profane holy things and pollute clean things. See? We live in a world that's doing both those. And the sinfulness of man is not only, as I've said, seen in making clean things dirty, but in making holy things common and treating them as common when they're not the holy. The third thing I learned from Leviticus as a Christian is the fullness of Christ, that God has provided a way of cleansing and his problem, his problem is how to reconcile justice and mercy. Should he deal with us in justice and punish us or deal with us in mercy and forgive us? Since God is both just and merciful, he must find a way of being just and merciful at the same time. It's almost impossible for us to find a way, but it has been possible for him by the way of the substitution of an innocent life for a guilty life. Only when that happens is justice satisfied and mercy satisfied. And it is the sacrificial laws of Leviticus that begin to show us how that can happen. Words like atonement, the word blood occurs many, many times because in the blood is the life. Take a person's blood away and you take their life away. And so you have this great emphasis and above all, each of those offerings, do you remember those offerings right back at the beginning, speaks of one aspect of the Christian life. The burnt offering speaks of the total surrender that's needed, the meal offering of our service, the peace offering of the serenity we can have with God, the peace of God that passes understanding. These are the three things that should characterise a grateful life, a life that's been saved. Move on to the other, others, however, and we begin to see his side, his sacrifice. See, the only sacrifices we have to bring now to the Lord when we come are sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. And they should be properly prepared and brought. But uh, these are the sacrifices that Jesus made. The sin offering tells us about the substitution of an innocent life for the guilty. And the trespass offering brings home to us that it satisfies divine justice, that there's some law that is being met by making this kind of sacrifice. It just looks straightforward 
to the New Testament. And finally, the fourth thing that I learned from the book of Leviticus when I study it, the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, the fullness of Christ to meet every need I have, and fourthly, godliness of life tells you to be holy in every part of your life, every part. You know there's a prayer in the Jewish prayer book to use when you go to the loo. Lovely prayer, praising God that your body's working all right and that that feels much better and you praise God for the relief and you come out of the toilet praising the Lord. Now you know to Western congregations that sounds crazy, that's not very spiritual. And I've been in some Christian toilets where the walls are plastered with texts and there have been a pile of devotional books for me to get my mind off things while I'm in there. And, and you know, the whole thing seems calculated to get me away from my present situation into a spiritual frame of mind. You know, that is so typical of us. We keep spirituality in a little part of our lives. Listen, when you're old, and your bladder and your bowels are beyond control, I think then you'll wish you'd praise the Lord when it was working properly. The New Testament talks about this body of our humiliation and the older we get the more humbled we are by it. But you see, God's interested in every part of your life. Holiness is wholeness. That's why when you read through the incredible detail into which God goes, as he applies his holiness to every part of their life, it tells you a godly life is godly through and through or it's not godly at all. However, there are two major shifts between the holiness of the old covenant and the holiness of the new. Two major shifts. And remember as we talk about this that the triple division between holy, clean and unclean still applies in the New Testament. That goes through. But there are two major alterations to it, two major shifts of thinking. First, holiness is moved from material things to moral things. Now that's rather important. The children of Israel were children, they had to be taught as children the difference between clean and unclean in matters of food, for example. There is no law for Christians that this food is clean and that is unclean. Peter had to learn that the hard way in Joppa, remember? Jesus said, it's not what goes into your mouth that makes you unclean now, but what comes out of your mouth. I remember hearing a preacher years ago talking to children. He said to the children, of whom I was one, do you know the difference between clean dirt and dirty dirt? dead silence. He said, clean dirt's on the outside of you and he said, it just needs soap and hot water and a good scrub and it's easy to get rid of, but dirty dirt's on the inside. And he said, that's very hard to get rid of. We understood. And that's the great difference. For them, clean and unclean was a matter of clothes and food. For us, it's a matter of clean and unclean morality. It shifted from the material to the moral. Do you understand? And now we don't have all these little regulations about food and clothes, but we have a lot of teaching about how to be holy in moral questions. The second major shift in the New Testament from the Old is that the rewards and punishments are shifted from this life to the next. And in this world, holy people may well suffer and not be rewarded, but it has shifted because in the New Testament we have a longer term view, this life is not the only one there is, this life is only the preparation for a much longer existence elsewhere. And so in the New Testament, great is your reward in heaven, not on earth. So the distinction between holy and clean and unclean still applies, but first it applies to moral rather than material things, and second, the rewards for obedience and the punishments for disobedience are shifted from this life to the next. Given those two major shifts, Leviticus is the most profitable book for Christians to read. It gives us those four things, the holiness of God, the sinfulness of men, the fullness of Christ and 
godliness of life. I'm going to finish there. It'll give me five more minutes in the next talk. Thank you for listening.